here. Um, if you're new, let me introduce myself. My name is Troy Grayson. I'm the campus minister for his house here. Um, at SVSU, Heather, over in the plaid at the computer is my wife, and she is also campus minister here at SVSU. And um, something about his house, our, our mission here is collaborating on the journey toward God's best. And one way we do that is through discipleship. And uh, for a long time, I just kind of relied on, well, we have worship, we have small groups, we have events, so people participate in that, they get discipled. And uh, re more recently, I've, I've come to understand discipleship in a much more specific way. And, and I looked for resources that would demonstrate what the Bible says, and I couldn't really find any that I, I particularly liked, and I felt God telling me to make what we need. And so I did, and we had this discipleship book, it's a curriculum, um, about 12 or 13 weeks, and it's full color. Um, we would love to go through this with you. Um, it, it's especially if, uh, if you're a Christian or are very seriously considering surrendering to God, uh, that this would be something to consider. And um, talk to me afterwards if you're interested. It, it goes through topics like uh, the Bible, the gospel, relationships, uh, prayer and fasting, stillness, spiritual warfare, stewardship, all, all kinds of things. So um, it gives a foundation, but it, it is great for new Christians. And it's great for older Christians to have a resource to use to invest in other younger Christians that they come across too. So talk to me if you're interested in that, um, and uh, whether you're new or old, or have been partly through it and, and didn't, weren't able to finish. Let me pray for the message right now. God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for gathering us together. And uh, I pray your Holy Spirit would be evident in this place. Pray you to eliminate distractions and tune us into you. Speak through me, God. Help us all take this to heart and apply it in our lives. I mean, we thank you and worship you. We want our time here to bring glory to you. Uh, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we started a series on mental health called Thinking Whole. We have, it is coming. Okay. So um, it's easy to fall into holes in our thinking. It happens to all of us in, in different ways and, and to different degrees. So this series addresses some ideas that they worked at the time. This time I had the right font installed on the computer, so it looks the way it's supposed to. Um, so. We're addressing some ideas that can help us take steps forward to thinking whole or wholly with a W instead of just being in a thinking hole with a kind of a downward spiral. Like I said last week, this is not meant to be a, a cure-all or an easy fix to all our mental problems or mental health issues. Some of us may need professional help to be able to think and feel in a somewhat normal capacity. Uh, I recognize that. I mentioned last week my dad actually needed that due to the traumas of war. He, he needed help to be able to think and feel things the way other people do. Um, but when my mental health is off, it just seems off, uh, there's a lot of things, a variety of factors that can affect that. Some physical factors like my sleep, nutrition, daylight, exercise, even Clutter or lack of clutter around me affects my mental health. I, I know through experience that adjusting those things does make a difference uh, in my mental health. But even, even more important than the physical factors, there's spiritual and mental factors, like whether or not I'm directing my thoughts in healthy, godly ways. Our series is based on Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. 
uh, that's exactly what this passage instructs us in. It's a several ways to direct our thoughts toward godly thinking. And when we do these things in pursuit of Jesus, uh, it'll help us experience the peace and wholeness of God. Uh, also, when we do apply these things that he, he gives us in this passage, Jesus gives it a supernatural boost so that it, it gives us a, a health and wholeness and peace that goes beyond what would make sense it would because of that supernatural boost that, that God gives it. So wherever I'm at on the mental health spectrum, uh, applying these things can help me take steps in the right direction. So let's open up our Bibles to that passage. It's Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. We'll go ahead and um, have a reading where I'll get ready. Uh, the book of Philippians was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in a city called Philippi. And the specific passage was written in the context of pursuing Jesus and staying true to him by following down the examples. So let's read that. Philippians 4. Verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you. I, I love how these two paragraphs talk about the peace of God and the God of peace, and I put those together. And Paul's idea of peace being growing up as a Jew and, and a strict um, sect of Jew, uh, his idea of peace would have stemmed from the Jewish word for peace, which was shalom. And, and shalom meant so much more than our English concept of peace. It, it meant wholeness, contentment, health. So that, that's what we're talking about in this series. Our, our theme passage has all these ideas about directing our thinking with God's promise of peace, wholeness, and health. Uh, so it's amazing to me how this passage that God inspired almost 2,000 years ago is so fitting to address our mental health issues of today. Last week we looked at verse 4, kind of focused in on that, which directed us to rejoice in Jesus always, regardless of the situation, which can be challenging at times, but always possible through Jesus. We explored some ways we can do that in choosing to always find something to be joyful about through Jesus uh, definitely improves our mental health. It, it's hard to be grumpy when we're choosing to be joyful. So tonight our focus is the first part of verse 5. Um, in the NIV it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Let your gentleness be evident to all. A year ago, this, this semester last year, we were going through a series on the fruit of the Spirit which is in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Those couple of verses list several qualities of someone who's demonstrating the Holy Spirit's work in their lives. Among those traits are joy, like we talked about last week, peace, like we're looking at with this whole series, and gentleness. Except that Paul used a different Greek word for gentleness than in, in the fruit of the Spirit passage than he used here in Philippians 4. Uh, gentleness in the fruit of the Spirit passage was talking about meekness. Uh, not weakness, but meekness with an M. The uh, basic idea was power under control. You, you could picture that with a tamed horse. Uh, a huge muscular horse could crush any one of us if it wanted to, but it won't because it's meek. It has its power under control. Jesus is the ultimate example of power under control in his life here. But again, um, 
that that was from the fruit of the Spirit, that's not the gentleness described here in Philippians 4 or 5. So here's the word we're going to focus on tonight. The Greek word is epicus. Epicus. And it can be translated as suitable, fair, reasonable, gentle, mild, patient, gracious. You could count I have a couple others, considerate or kind. So rather than focusing on power under control, uh, the basic idea of epicus involves not demanding our way or not standing on our rights. Not demanding our way or not standing on our rights. So quite an un-American concept, right? Think about all the political, racial, and health opinions that we've heard over the last two years uh, with people getting pretty heated about those opinions. Americans are all about our rights or, or getting our way. So, epicus gentleness may seem un-American, but it's a very Christ-like attitude for us to adopt. Um, have you ever been in a thinking hole that downward spiral that stems from the thought, I have been robbed. I have. Um, whether it was like a truly traumatic experience and you were really wronged or something that didn't actually matter, um, when we replay that over and over in our minds that we've been wronged, it makes it kind of difficult to respond in a way that is gentle that is suitable, fair, reasonable, mild, patient, gracious. Sometimes opposite examples can help us wrap our minds around a concept. So um, how many of us have had a job that we worked directly with customers? Ever worked directly with customers? A lot of us. So how many have ever encountered an irate customer? <laughs> Most of us, again. Um, the issue at hand may have been this big, but their response was this big. And uh, if you've never experienced that personally, maybe you witnessed it as you walked by a customer service desk at one point, or um, seen it on a show or social media post. Uh, I remember when I was fairly young that my mom got pretty upset at a McDonald's counter person, um, brought over the manager, all, all that, um, she felt like the tax on the meal was rounded to the wrong penny. So, you know, you have the cost and then you apply 6% to that. That's not always going to be a whole penny in, in the math. So if you have a penny 0.3, math tells you that should round down. Um, but my mom believed that they rounded up when they shouldn't have. And so she got out her calculator and was showing that the, the cash register at McDonald's was programmed wrong or, or something. And she got kind of heated about it. The thing is, my dad was an engineer. He, he made good money. So that penny did not matter. But my mom had it in her head that she was wronged and, and she was not gentle in that situation. Our, our theme verse says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The ESV, ESV says it like this, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Another example, uh, did something ever happen in traffic and your response was kind of rude? And then you realized Maybe you make eye contact or something, and you realize you know that person. Has anyone ever done something like that? Yeah. Uh, and then what? what's the first thought? Well, if I realized who it was, I wouldn't have done that. Well, let your gentleness be evident to all, not just your church friends that you recognized, or, or whatever the case may be. So here's a good self-reflection question for us. Even if I've been wronged, am I responding in a suitable, godly way? Even if I've been wronged, am I responding in a suitable, godly way? And that's a great gentleness test. Before we get into some other passages, 
learn about that uh, ethicus gentleness, but to define our why a little better. Why are we doing a series on mental health? Um, is it because it, it's a buzzword? Uh, because lack of mental health seems to be more prevalent today, uh, more, more than ever? Is it so we can ultimately feel better about ourselves? Or so we can have freedom to pursue our desires? So let's back up a moment and get a few glimpses of the passage that leads into our theme passage. Um, so Philippians 3, we're going to read some verses from that. Philippians 3, verse 8, 12, and 17 through 19, just to condense it a little bit. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 17-19. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now will tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is in their, is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. All right, thank you. So Paul says that knowing and following Jesus is by far the most important pursuit in life. He told us to follow his example. Um, he also said that people he knew who rejected Christ did so because their minds were focused on earthly things selfish desires and cravings, inward focus, even, even shameful things. But we're supposed to do the opposite of that. So why are we doing a series on mental health? What's the purpose? The ultimate purpose of our mental health is to know and follow Jesus better. The ultimate purpose of our mental health is to know and follow Jesus better. That, that's why we want to have clear thinking and feeling so we can follow Jesus better. So this series is not about self-serving, self-help. Um, it, it's about taking steps in our mental health through what we're learning in this passage so we can pursue Jesus. So tonight's idea of gentleness can help with that, that peace and wholeness found in Christ that help with pursuing Christ. So what do other passages say that can help us understand this uh, ethicus gentleness? Um, the, the word used for gentleness in the fruit of the Spirit is actually used more in the New Testament. This, this one just has a handful of passages. Um, it's used in a list of how God's people should behave. Uh, it's used in a list describing some traits of someone who wants to become an overseer or a, a servant leader in a church. Once it's even used to butter up a court official uh, before presenting a legal case. Um, there are some religious leaders bringing a charge against Paul, and they're like, Oh, governor, we ask in your graciousness to hear us briefly. And that word graciousness or kindness is referring to our word for gentleness. And uh, it doesn't really help us apply gentleness. I thought it was kind of funny and melodramatic the way it was used there. Um, still a good word, but wasn't used in a very genuine way there. So how can we use and apply this word sincerely? Let's look at uh, this next passage. It's 1 Peter 2, verse 18. 1 Peter 2, verse 18. Servants. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to good and gentle, but also to the unjust. All right. Um, how are you visualize this passage and who it's referring to, whether you have in mind like the worst slave situation possible or just like an employee environment? Um, Peter tells us this passage 
in this passage to respect and obey our master, our, our boss, however you want to say it, even if they don't demonstrate gentleness toward us. So if I ask what situations I should be demonstrating gentleness, I think it's all of them. Even if the other person isn't demonstrating gentleness back towards me. Our, our theme passage says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Another passage about Epicus gentleness is in the book of James. Let's take a look at that. It's James 3, verses 14 through 18. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So this passage is comparing two kinds of wisdom, uh, worldly or even demonic wisdom versus true heavenly wisdom. And, and the godly wisdom is going to be gentle. It's going to encourage gentleness. Uh, back to that self-reflection question I asked earlier. Um, even if I'm wrong, am I responding in a suitable, godly way? Asking that question can help us apply godly wisdom. Uh, a, a coworker, a classmate, a roommate, a family member might say that it's perfectly acceptable to get worked up, defend our rights and our ambitions and every selfish little want that we have. Um, but that would be worldly wisdom, not godly wisdom speaking. It, and it's important to recognize the difference with those voices and influences in our lives. Godly wisdom wants me to demonstrate gentleness, purity, shalom, reason, mercy, fruitfulness, impartiality, and sincerity. Whereas earthly or demonic wisdom wants me to give in to things like jealousy, selfish ambition, deceit, pride, evil practices. I, I think if we honestly try to tell the difference between the wisdoms, I will make it clear for us. That leads us to one more gentleness passage. This is 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 5. It's responding in a suitable, godly way. 
Gentleness is not passivity. It's responding in a suitable, godly way. You know, if Jesus were physically standing right next to me, would he think my response is fitting for the situation, whatever given situation you're in? Or am I being easily offended, trying to force my way, fighting for a selfish want? Am I being quick to go over the top with my response? Gentleness can and should offer grace uh, that's not deserved and not reciprocated. But being gentle does not mean being a pushover. It, it, it doesn't mean you, you don't fight for the right thing. It just means you don't fight for the selfish thing. So how do we do that? Um, we discern when and how to show gentleness and or firmness by taking every thought captive to obey Christ. What the passage was just saying, we discern when and how to show gentleness and or firmness by taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Paul was, was showing both at the same time in his passage. You know, it is the way I feel like responding coming from earthly wisdom or from godly wisdom. Just taking that moment to ask that question can really help us apply gentleness in situations where we probably would not otherwise. This applies to how we, how we respond to others, and it applies to how we respond, how we apply it to our self-talk self -talk as well. Sometimes the person we tend to be harshest on is ourselves. So I am in need of my gentleness just as much as everyone else needs it. I am in need of my gentleness just as much as everyone else needs it in my internal dialogue. So next time you're tempted to call yourself stupid or clumsy or worthless or you know, fill in the blank that tends to pop up, take that thought captive to obey Christ. Reject the earthly, demonic wisdom. Replace it with the truth, heavenly wisdom. You know, maybe there's a negative message that, that pops up over and over in your self-talk. Uh, find some truths in God's word that say the truth about it and, and counteract that negativity. And repeat those verses, memorize them. Repeat them over and over until you believe it. That is how you respond with gentleness to yourself. Um, a way that is fitting, reasonable, patient, gracious to ourselves as well as others. So directing our thinking to demonstrate gentleness to others is a great way to strengthen our mental health in our pursuit of Jesus. And directing our thinking to show gentleness toward ourselves is even more so will help us be able to pursue Jesus more. So even if I've been wronged, or done wrong myself, done wrong to myself, am I responding in a suitable, godly way? God, I, I thank you um, that you want us to think through how we respond to others, how we respond to ourselves, and, and the, just the thoughts that conflict in our minds sometimes. Uh, God, I thank you that um, you know, even though we're, we're, we're born with this tendency to sin and we always end up choosing it, uh, you give grace to us. You want us to give grace to others. You want us to um, control our emotions and, and filter our thoughts and choose the ones that glorify you. God, we thank you that you give us the ability to do that through your Holy Spirit for those of us who have responded to your message of hope. God, I thank you, and God, I pray you help us bring this to mind. So when, when we're about to not be gentle in the coming week, you remind us and just give us a little pause and reflection so that we can apply gentleness, not just on the outside, but start to develop on develop it in you know, our thinking as well. God, we, we thank you and uh, pray you would continue to work
work in this as we pursue you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a little discussion time. And then